Welcome to the Reimagining Faith podcast with the Pastors Jackson. This is a podcast for seekers, dreamers, and fellow sojourners who are trying to figure out what it means to be followers of Jesus in the 21st century. We're recording this episode on June 16th, uh, just three days before June 19th or Juneteenth. And one of our deepest convictions at Open Table UCC is um, a commitment to the ongoing work of being anti-racist. I say ongoing work because um, we don't reach some kind of um, <laughs> place of <laughs> some final destination. Right. I'm um, disavowed of white privilege and white supremacy, and now correct. I'm made perfect. <laughs> yeah. Um, but really just this this commitment to keeping at it, to keep showing up, to keep— mm. Um, doing the work of confession and repentance and um, taking steps forward to creating a better world. We want to take uh, this this week to tell some stories about our own experiences um, of our of our coming to understand our whiteness, to coming to understand our place in the world, as well as our experiences of really coming to grips with our convictions, that we have as followers of Jesus specifically to the responsibility we have to work at being anti-racist, especially as white folks who in many ways have the choice um, Mm. whether or not to engage in this work. That's a privilege, by the way. (laughs) Um, And we are two white pastors who are experts at our own experience. We are not experts at anyone else's experience. We are not experts at being a Black person in um, in the United States in 2022, but experts in our own experience. And so we are going to try our hardest to speak to that place and not to anyone else's experience unless we are directly quoting them. Uh, yeah, and I'll put a we'll put some links in the, in the description and the show notes below for some podcasts that you can listen to, uh, recorded from people of color about their own experience in their own words. That if if you'd like to hear more and learn, kind of try to continue to figure out the places where your blind spots are. Yeah. So what is Juneteenth? Juneteenth National Independence Day which was officially recognized as a national holiday on June 17, 2021, happens every year on June 19th. Um, This has been celebrated for a much longer time than that, but um, our country officially recognized it as a national holiday just last year. And so um, the story, if if you are not familiar, um, is that What many of us know um, and have learned in our history classes is that uh, President Abraham Lincoln pronounced the Emancipation Proclamation on January 1st, 1863, that officially said that slavery was no longer legal, uh, that institution, institutional slavery was not acceptable uh, at that time. Hmm. And so just like that... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> all of the slaves, all of the enslaved people in our country were freed, right? A hundred percent, because Abraham Lincoln was such a wonderful person who cared deeply about the inherent goodness and worth of every human being, and not at all because it was a great military strategy to uh, take away the forced military service of people in the South. Correct. Yeah. Uh, and and hopefully you heard a bit of our uh, tongue-in-cheek tone. Um, because no, that actually is not what happened. Um, and uh, you'll notice I said January 1st, uh, 1863, but it was not until June 19th, 1865. So like two and a half years later, um, almost exactly to the day, was the official announcement of Union Army General Granger Gordon in Texas to say that uh, slavery was no longer Institutional slavery was no longer yeah. legal. So the people who were enslaved in Texas didn't get the word yeah. about their freedom for two and a half years. Yeah. So they were free, but didn't know it. It took two years to get there because Texas was the last state of the Confederacy with institutional slavery. Um, it's actually the reason why there's a panhandle in Oklahoma was because the the line that the the 
agreement they had made years prior that any state below this particular line, geographic line, would be a slave state if they chose to, and anything north would have to be a free state. And so Texas li- technically had a little bit of property above that, and so it would have made them a free state, but they wanted their slaves, so they gave up that tract of land to Oklahoma so that they could be a fully slave state. So two and a half years later, after the Emancipation Pro- Proclamation, um, Texas was informed that they, too, were free. And the following year uh, in Galveston, Texas, uh, this June 19th kind of became this Independence Day that actually was an Independence Day. So it it became this this holiday in many communities that celebrated um, the African-American experience, that celebrated the celebrated culture, celebrated uh, and commemorated this emancipation of enslaved African Americans in the United States. And, you know, the ways that it has been celebrated um, ranges anywhere from super awesome cookouts to church services to uh, community gatherings. It's now a national holiday, which is, is pretty great. But it has caused us to pause. Um, as we have been thinking about what this holiday means to us, it, it feels a little bit less celebratory uh, and a little bit more of an invitation to do some internal investigation, maybe. I don't yeah. know if that's the right way to say it. Yeah, interrogation might be a more apt word. Yeah. Like, where where has been my place in all of this? As a white middle-class woman, uh, as a white pastor in the Christian church, as I have known it, as someone who at different points in her life has identified, as someone who is not racist, (laughs) uh, as someone who has identified as racist, as someone who has desired to be an ally and continues to make so many mistakes, um, big and small. What does it mean to follow Jesus as an anti-racist? Uh, the church has not, oh, it, it is not, and, and still continues, honestly, to, to be a tool, a, a place where racism is sanctified, and maybe not overtly, uh, but certainly institutionally, certainly um, in culture. Um, yeah, I mentioned in, um, well, actually this was, I mentioned this in a, uh, my other podcast, the Down the Wormhole podcast, that that white supremacy is not a problem that the church faces. It's a problem that the church invented. Hmm. We birthed white supremacy. We created the idea of whiteness itself whiteness as a concept, as a designation of of a person's racial identity was a creation because of a particular theological problem in the 17th century or so. Can I do a little history? Sure. Can I break it down a little bit? Sure. Okay. I'm a, I'm a huge history nerd, and I, I have firmly believe that the some of the best ways that we can exercise our demons are to fully understand where their roots are, hmm. that we can not just keep plucking off the flowers that bloom from these weeds, but we can get down to their very roots and pull them up entirely. Um, I think we can trace a lot of this back to the era of quote-unquote discovery um, from from Europe when when they first sailed across the Atlantic and found this great continent full of fertile soil and trusting people. And we, as Europeans, who were on this overcrowded half a continent um, Hmm. full of war and hatred and violence— needed more places to go spill out our war and hatred and violence. And so we started colonizing those places. In the name of Jesus. Well, (laughs) not at first. At first it was in the name of tea and spices, but we, that feels icky. (laughs) 
And so we needed to justify it in God's name. And so it was Pope Nicholas V, in, in starting in 1452, released a series of papal bulls, which are not actual bulls. They're, they're statements, they're declarations of, of truth. And he was writing to the, the king of Portugal, King Alfonso, and he gave him permission, and I quote from Pope Nicholas, to invade, search out, capture, vanquish, and subdue all Saracens, or Muslims, and pagans, or Africans and North Americans, whatsoever, and other enemies of Christ, wheresoever placed, and the kingdoms, dukedoms, principalities, dominions, possessions, and all movable and immovable goods, whatsoever held and possessed by them, and to reduce their persons to perpetual slavery. Perpetual slavery becomes a key word in the uh, the Atlantic slave trade, because that means that the children of these enslaved people are born slaves. Perpetual means from now until forever. Hmm. And so they used that that papal bull and a number afterwards to to create a theological grounding for this work. This is where the idea that you know this is this is our divine right to be in this place, and that these people, they are not fully people, they are infidels, they are pagans, they are less than human, and it is our divine right then to use them and subjugate them like cattle. Hmm. And so this is the beginning of it. And so they start shipping over millions and millions of African people to um to the, into the, mostly into the Caribbean, where the working conditions were so awful, people only lived a couple of years. And intermixed throughout um, these African enslaved people were Europeans who were indentured servants. So indentured servants are people who um, maybe they're working off a prison sentence or a debt or something like that, and they are to work for X amount of years, and then their debt is forgiven. Um, so, you know, you stole something in, in, in France and now you have to come over here and work in the cotton fields for seven years and then you're free. So then there's this weird dynamic then between people who's, who are Christians and then people who are indebted forever <laughs> to be servants. And there was some fear among the slave owners that the there would there would be an uprising in that and so in order to keep those two classes of group of people separate they needed to give certain rights to the european indentured servants that the african perpetual slaves did not have and in that way pit the two against each other hmm. so that the the indentured whites would uh, would still feel superior to their peers and not organize with them any kind of rebellion or revolt. Yeah. <laughs> so now we're starting to see tears. But then it gets even more complicated because in the night in the 1670s, you've got these Christian missionaries. Um, like George Fox, the Quakers were really into uh, this sort of evangelism, where they would go into the plantations and they would preach the gospel to these enslaved people who, for the most part, wanted nothing to do with it. Because, of course, why wouldn't they? But this is problematic because the law, as passed down by the church, is that you cannot perpetually enslave Christians. Mm. The law that the Pope sent out and that all of the um, the doctrine of discovery is based on is that you can only do this to Saracens and pagans. So <laughs> Muslims and black people, essentially, you can make them be perpetual slaves. But if they become Christians, well, then that's a problem. So at first they were outlawed from preaching there, but that didn't work. You can't outlaw Christians. They just fight back. So then they outlawed <laughs> conversion and that didn't quite work because they were meeting in secret. And the way that Christianity does, it's a religion that just, it doesn't work well under oppression. Um, it, it carries within it its own seeds of liberation. And so eventually they had to rewrite the laws. 
they had to figure out a way to keep these Africans enslaved forever and these indentured servants only for a little while. So the laws, as they started to be rewritten in that time, defined indentured servants as whites and perpetual slaves as blacks. And that is the first time that that distinction is made. So the distinction of whiteness, of being a white person, is created by slaveholders because of a theological problem of wanting to own human beings, but then having to try to figure out a way of not owning people that look and sound like them. Because like, if you asked people during that time what they were, they would say, I'm an Englishman, I'm a Frenchman, I'm an Irishman. Um, mm. And then if you pushed them further, they might say, I'm a Christian. But they had no, no concept of whiteness. They saw themselves as where they had come from. You know, if, if, you told, if you confused a German and a Spaniard as both being the same thing, as both being white, oh, they would have spit in your face. Of course, they're not the same thing. Each individual country has been at war for hundreds of years. They've hmm. got their own identities, their own cultures and foods and songs and languages and all of that. They all saw themselves as different. Whiteness is created on the plantations by the hmm. slaveholders in response to a theological problem. Hmm. So white supremacy, racism, and whiteness are created by the church are baptized by the church and then are used as tools of oppression by the church to continue on these awful um, practices. And so when we inherit this, not that many generations later, we are not inheriting a problem that big, bad, uh, cloak-wearing racists created and that we good, open, liberal-loving people need to, you know, address <laughs> and help or solve. This is not a problem for the black church to deal with. This is a problem that we created that is just as much of our heritage as all of the good things that we've done, all the hospitals and schools and all of that. We need to own this as our legacy. Hmm and make it our work to deconstruct it. Yeah, which is not easy work to do because first you have to actually acknowledge that it exists, that it is our issue, that we did create it, and to acknowledge our part in that, which um, is really hard for uh, white people to do. I have been reading this book by ta Coates called Between the World and Me. And he wrote this section about an, an experience that happened when um, he was in a public place and his, his four-year-old and him were um, coming down an escalator. And a white woman pushed him and said, come on, he wasn't going fast enough. And there was this whole situation where, of course, dad comes to his son's defense and is rightfully angry, as any parent would be. And he suddenly finds himself having to be on the defense, having to walk away with shame. And he writes this incredibly painfully convicting uh, passage. And I'm just, I'm just going to read this. So, so this is ta Coates' Between the World and Me on page 97. But I am not ashamed because I am a bad father, a bad individual, or ill-mannered. I'm ashamed that I made an error, knowing that our errors always cost us more. This is the import of the history all around us, though very few people like to think about it. Had I informed this woman that when she pushed my son, she was acting according to a tradition that held black bodies as lesser, her response would likely have been, quote, I am not a racist, or maybe not, 
But my experience in this world has been that the people who believe themselves to be whites are obsessed with the politics of personal exoneration. And the word racist to them conjures, if not a tobacco-spitting oaf, (laughs) then something just as fantastic, an orc, troll, or a gorgon. I'm not a racist, an entertainer once insisted after being filmed repeatedly yelling at a heckler. He's an N-word. He's an N-word. Considering segregationist Senator Strom Thurmond, Richard Nixon concluded, Strom is no racist. There are no racists in America, or at least none that the people who need to be white know personally. In the era of mass lynching, it was so difficult to find who specifically served as executioner that such deaths were often reported by the press as having happened, quote, at the hands of persons unknown. And I I keep coming back to this again and again and again in my own life, wanting to defend myself, wanting to to be a good person. And I th- the more I read, the longer I live, the more experience I have, and especially now being a parent, um, the issue that most of us white folks have is not being able to own up to our own stuff and the stuff of our ancestors that we have inherited um, that make us look like bad guys, mm. that make us look... Like we aren't kind-hearted, that we aren't generous, that we aren't hospitable, that we aren't Christian. To admit these things, I think in our minds, makes it so that we're not who we thought we were. Mm. We are so fragile. Yeah, it's 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 (laughs) this fragility. This this if I did something bad, I am a bad person, and therefore have no responsibility in changing anything. It's just who I am. And just who I am, you're saying is bad. Hmm. And because I don't want to be bad, I'm not racist. (laughs) Even though we all hold prejudice, we all hold bias, we all, within ourselves, like, we cling to the familiar. We cling to the things that we understand and can make sense of. And so I want to share a story that happened about 17 years ago, um, in my life. I was living in North Lawndale, a a neighborhood uh, in Chicago. And uh, this neighborhood was primarily African-American. I was partaking in a year-long urban mission program called Mission Year. And I lived in a apartment with uh, five other young adults, um, all who were white to, I guess, really just be immersed in a culture that is that was not our own. And, and one day, uh, my, one of my roommates and I were walking down the street. Um, we were walking back from like the dollar store or something. And we weren't, you know, dressed professionally. We were just, I mean, maybe jeans, sweatpants, whatever. And a cop pulls over and starts questioning us. Hmm. What are you doing here? And we would respond, we live here. Um, and he looked at us suspiciously and and like, where? And so we told him what street and he said, where? And we told him our address. And then he asked us, and where is that? And we were literally like a block away. Um, and so we literally pointed at the house. We live <laughs> right there. <laughs> and he said, why? <laughs> Which... I've never been asked why I live in a place, but um, because we live and work here. And he asked again, why? Like this, inter- the interrogation um, just only made us more angry. Not necessarily scared, angry. And our responses became more defensive. They became a little bit more arrogant, um, a little more testy, a little more frustrated and annoyed. Um, and eventually we told him we we are living here for a year um, to uh, to learn about the area, to do work here, to get to know our neighbors and everything. And he said, you sure got the short end of the stick. Hmm. And I remember thinking, wow, <laughs> this cop surely sees this community um, 
in a very specific way. Uh, the the very person who is has been sent here to protect the people of this community does not have a very good outlook. And I very we we gave him quick responses, um, and eventually he left us alone and he drove away. And I remember being so angry that how dare he? How dare he ask me why I live in a place? <laughs> how dare he insinuate that this neighborhood is is bad? How dare he um, question me about my intentions for walking down the street? And years later, I look back on that experience um, with a bit of shame, a bit of embarrassment, not because I deserved better respect than that, but the kind of privilege and flagrant <laughs> responses that I gave to this cop. I, I, I recognize that, you know, I was not brought up to be afraid of police. I was afraid to, I, I was raised to be, to see them as protectors, to see them as heroes and people to, people to try to be like. But in that particular situation, I was an outsider. They didn't hurt us. They didn't um, try to arrest us. They didn't come to investigate our house to make sure that we were telling the truth. And, and I did not recognize in that moment that my willingness to be disrespectful and even defensive without even thinking twice about it, without even thinking that this might have consequences, severe consequences, that was that was a privilege. That wasn't a given. Um, I mean, it was given. It was given without me asking for it. And one that I, I took at face value. I also recognized that I was living in a place that I chose to come to mm. and that I chose to leave which was not an option for folks. This neighborhood was home to a lot of violence, a lot of drug trafficking. It was a poor community. And I felt like I needed people to respect me. Mm. <laughs> As if that was the most important thing. Mm -hmm. um, it was naive. It was, it was, it's embarrassing. A little colonial. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so even... So, so now I even question what right I had to even be there. Like what, like this experiment <laughs> of spending a year in a place that's not my own and pretending that I'm doing something good there. What right do I have to do that? Like who, who was this experience even good for? Yeah. Yeah. I'm um, like, I've, I had similar experiences with like short-term mission trips. Right. And it's like, all right, well, we're going to go help these poor people in Tegucigalpa because they can't help themselves. They can't even mm -hmm. tie their own shoes. They're so poor and destitute. And we're going to show up and a bunch of 16-year-olds are going to build a school for them and give them our old T-shirts and we're going to save the day. But the point of the whole thing was never to help them. It was to broaden our horizons as <laughs> if the rest of the world exists only to educate white people, to help us. Because we're so good. We're so righteous. And not recognizing how derogatory that was. Like, I was seeing that neighborhood the same way that cop was seeing that neighborhood, mm -hmm. as something to be saved, as something beyond redemption, as if there weren't actual people living there. There weren't kids and parents and grandparents who had been there for generations, who deserved every ounce of dignity, who, in, who deserved investment, who deserved to be treated like a human. Yeah, I think that's one of the big learnings in, in self-discoveries that I've had over the past couple of years, at least, has been that shift in, in mindset. That, and I think this is probably what the white church needs to be working on, is listening before speaking, or maybe not even speaking at all um, in some circles, in some places, or not even speaking to some issues. And what I did 
for years is I listened to the voices of the marginalized and then I interpreted the voices mm. of the marginalized for the voices of the, of the marginalizers, of the oppressors, that I would take the message that I heard from, you know, my black friends would tell me their stories and I would take their anger and their hopes and dreams and would translate them into a way that nice white people could hear mm. and understand that was me being a bridge builder. But really what that was, was me further marginalizing those people because now I'm saying to them that they don't know how to communicate or they don't know what's best for them, right? So I, I even, even just two years ago, even, you know, 2020, all of the unrest that's happening, there's calls to defund the police. Now, I felt it my duty to then take that slogan, defund the police, and then expound on that and interpret that for my white friends mm. to tell them that this is not, don't you worry. They're not trying to get rid of the good cops. They're trying to redistribute resources so that we can better take care of the community. And here's the ways that we can use money instead of for military equipment. And we can increase this and that and the other. And like, I'm, I'm removing the rage from the situation. Hmm. And the rage is the impetus behind the whole thing. Like, you should be enraged. You should be enraged that, you know, a, a white cop can keep his his knee on a black man's neck for nine and a half minutes and that n the other cops around don't stop. Don't stop them from happening. You know, and every time you hear, oh, it's just a couple of bad apples, and we forget that the rest of the phrase is a few bad apples spoils the barrel, hmm. that those who sit by complicitly and allow systems to continue are also violently oppressing, even if they are not physically oppressing. And so like that rage that builds up in there, I need to own that rage. I need, if I'm going to be a translator, I can't diminish the rage, the anger, the fierceness behind it. I can't, I can't then translate it into what nice white culture. It needs to still be there and it needs to, I need to honor it. And I'm, that has taken a while and I'm, I'm still not totally comfortable because, you know, a part of whiteness is this, this insistent niceness. Um, we don't, we don't want to rock the boat. We don't want to shake things up. We want to be uh, agreeable and bipartisan and find Common ground. Common ground that does not shift the the status quo. We we can't express our emotions, our anger. But I am just learning how much I have tried to colonize other people's experiences and then make them more palatable for people like me. When in reality, people like me need to just pull up our britches and accept reality. So what does that look like in practice? How do we be an anti-racist church uh, or a church striving to be more anti-racist? Well, let me give you um, the play-by-play, -play, the um, numbered bullet points um, <laughs> of what it means to do that since we have so... Um, perfected? Perfected this? and become experts on this. No, we're both learning... And every time I think we become like certain that we've we've conquered this one thing, something else comes undone. So I think in in many ways, um, one of the th I think the very first thing we need to do is to recognize that we are not ever going to reach some perfection in this by nature of who we are uh, and the skin that we wear. Speaking of, of from from the white experience, um, we will always need to work at this um, because privilege isn't always something that is recognizable until you witness someone who does not have that privilege uh, experience the repercussions. So I think part of it is is recognizing that this is going to be an ongoing process, which I know I don't like. I I don't like that I keep working for something that 
it's not ever going to be completely achieved. But recognizing this takes some humility mm-hmm. and I have to be willing to be seen as not pure, um, as not wholly good with with motives that have that are that are completely pure. Yeah, I wish I could explain that away, but I can't. <laughs> it's just it, humility yeah. um, and and practicing it over and over and over again. So I see kind of two two strands here, two streams of of action in in furthering the work of anti-racism in a church. Mm. Um, one is active and one is subtle, I'll say, more than passive. Um, in the, the active sense, um, we need to be joining the fight where the fight already exists. Um, if you are the pastor of a white church, don't start an anti-racism working group in your white church. Go find a church that is doing it and join them hmm. in the community. Chances are they know more than you do, you know, no matter what books you've read. Go find the local chapter, the NAACP, and ask how you can help with the work that's actually needed in the community, hmm. not trying to come in with the solutions that you think would work. Um, that is the same sort of what Chimamanda Adichie calls um, patronizing well-meaning pity hmm. <laughs> that white folks often have. Well-meaning, good-natured, liberal white folks who often come in and do more harm than good because they don't listen. So whatever that looks like in your community, you know, it's going to be different for every community. Um, and, and the more subtle way, I think, is changing our language intentionally in worship. Hmm. I think it means replacing white Jesus. Hmm. Pictures of white Jesus, paintings, statues. It, it means getting rid of your white Jesus nativity set. Mm. Um, because not only is that historically inaccurate, <laughs> but it has been used as a tool of subtle oppression for hundreds and hundreds of years. Mm. That when Jesus looks like you, then you set yourself up as superior. Yeah. You know, you need... To you as a, a dark-skinned person needs to come to the foot of white Jesus to receive salvation when Jesus was not a white person. Um, the only person with a speaking role in the Bible who is white is Pontius Pilate. It's not great. <laughs> so I think we need to change our, our language in worship. I think we need to do away with music and liturgy that talk about being made white as snow as a good thing. <laughs> and clearing away the darkness and the blackness of our soul. E- even if those, those phrases don't have implicit, don't have explicitly racist origins, language like that continues to further the, uh, the implicit bias that already exists. So instead of tar- talking about darkness to light, maybe talk about the shades of dawn. You know, there's there's plenty of other ways that we can talk about these things as opposed to white is good, black is bad. Because we, no matter how enlightened we are, these sorts of little linguistic things do add up over time. You know, my, my favorite example of this is a study that was done a while back in which they asked um, people who spoke English as a second language to give adjectives for a bridge. And they asked Spanish-speaking people and German-speaking people, like that was their native language, to define a bridge. Give me a couple adjectives. And the only difference between the two people is that in German, and I and I hope I'm not getting this confused, um, the word for bridge is feminine, and in Spanish it's masculine. And it's just, it's just grammatic. It's not they don't have genitals. It's just grammatic uh, <laughs> nouns. But the, the, the Germans used more stereotypically feminine adjectives to describe it, things like elegant and, um, and connecting. And the, the Spanish-speaking people used more words like strong and large and powerful. And it, it just it, it infects our mind the way that we use language, the subtle ways we do it. And so you people who are organizing worship services, if you keep this in the forefront of your mind, 
and you think about the ways that your language is impacting people without realizing it, and you change things around. We call God different names. We, we look at God differently. We put different pictures and representations of God. We try to diminish the whiteness as much as possible. Over time, that will make a substantive difference in the way that we just automatically respond to situations. Mm. And I think at the root of, of the, the actions that we take, what I think is really, really important is to center voices of color, which, you know, if you are a homogenous group of uh, white Christians, you know, what are you, what are you nourishing your spirit with? Are you hearing voices of color? Are you reading voices of color? Are you interacting with people? Are you intentionally placing yourselves in, in, in spaces where you are not the majority person. Yeah. Well, one of the things that I've seen white churches do quite a bit is um, take on like a buddy church, mm-hmm. like a predominantly black church. Mm-hmm. And like the pastors become good friends and they do these things together and these sort of like mutual learning, listening activities and worship services together. And as well-meaning as that is, 99% of the learning needs to be done by the white folk. The, the black congregation knows what it's like to live in white America. You don't need to educate black people about <laughs> what it's like to live in white America. They live in it. They have to adapt to white America constantly. Mm. It's the white folks who don't know what it's like to live in white America as a black person. And so those cultural exchange programs are so often billed as like ways of learning each other's world when in reality it ends up being the burden of it is on the black church to educate the white church so the white church can feel better about its whiteness and that it is reaching out and trying. So if you are going to do something like that, make it more one way, make Mm -hmm. it more service based, servant based. How can we help you? How can we serve you? How can we, you know, help you as opposed to how can we help each other? Going back to that humility, um, in your listening, listen with humility. Um, I know that, you know, back to that whole like white exoneration, like we want to believe that we're good people. When I listen to a story or an experience that a person of color is sharing with me, and I either try to explain it away or I take some pride um, in being able to name what was wrong or or even when there is a a suggestion or a question that something we did Mm. was racist, my gut instinct is to to defend myself, to explain it away, to say, oh, that's not what I meant, da 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 Like, listen. Listen and allow yourself to show up to that. Allow yourself to consider what the person is saying. Allow yourself to be wrong. Like, it's okay to say, I, I didn't realize that. I'm so sorry. I'm going to try to do better. Yeah. Like, if we can't do that, we cannot make progress. And so many times the same people who will say, there is no such thing as white privilege. There's no such thing as white supremacy. I'm not inherently racist by being a white person. I didn't inherit anything. Well, then in the same pulpit tell you that you are born inherently sinful <laughs> and that you require the salvation of Jesus Christ in order to overcome this inherent sinfulness that you inherited that is systemic and that is within all of us in the systems that we um, that we have. And like the cognitive dissonance there. Yeah. You know, I heard somebody say that, I'll tell you that you can trace your sins back to Adam, but not to 1619. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Right? <laughs> <laughs> and so, like, just in the same way that it is so easy for Christians to say, I am inherently broken, I am living in a broken world, and I need Jesus to save me from this, from my brokenness personally and my pro- brokenness societally. 
and I need to have humility to recognize my own brokenness before Jesus can save me. So too, in just about the same exact way, (laughs) um, although I don't really believe in original sin, the concept rolls over almost one-to-one to to, Hmm. to this. You as a white person have inherited systems of racism that were created by the European and American churches. You have benefited from it. And the only way to get through this is through humbly admitting that and then a lifetime of work to overcome it, just as it is a lifetime of work to overcome your sinful nature. Hmm. And just in the same way, it requires community and it requires the grace of God. So there is a lot more that we could say, a lot more that we can dig into. There's a lot of really incredible uh, books and podcasts and videos out there um, for you to educate yourself on. (laughs) Um, Really, in this this information age, you have no excuse for being uneducated anymore in, in these sorts of issues. The only excuse you have is that you don't want to, which, you know— If you want to own that as well and sit with that for a while, that might be good. (laughs) Might be a good place to start. (laughs) Yeah. Um, But this is work that we are trying to work out in real time as we're planting this church and trying it to be a church plant and not, um, (laughs) I heard Lenny Duncan um, talking about his experience um, as a church planter in the evangelical world. And he described one of the church plants he was a part of in Fishtown as a church plantation. (laughs) Uh, We're trying not to do that. We're trying not to show up in a community and assume that we know how to save it and fix it. And even not to come into it, assuming it's our, there's anything to save or fix. So we're trying to live this out and work this out and it's messy and we're making mistakes and we're trying to listen and we're trying to do better. And so as we plant this church, we would covet your prayers, mm-hmm. <laughs> prayers for our own humility and our sight. And folks, if you heard something that you disagree with or that made you feel really uncomfortable, if you have a correction, please contact us. Please let us know. Again, we are not experts We are just people with experiences who keep learning and who keep trying and who are committed to continuing to show up, (laughs) even and especially when it gets difficult. Thankfully, we're doing that with, with people who are committed to the same thing, but we recognize it's not a, an easy journey. So please correct us. And we will do our best to make sure that we share those with you all. Next week, speaking of, we will be joined by the rabbi, Rachel Jackson, making it three Jacksons in one podcast. No relation. Rachel will be joining us to talk about being good interfaith allies Um, I know she's got quite a few stories of some really helpful, wonderful Christians that have been really important in her journey as the lone rabbi within a (laughs) 50-mile radius, Um, and also some stories of some very well-meaning allies who ended up doing more harm than good. Um, Rachel has been so helpful in my own journey in pointing out all the ways that I was not a very good ally and hopefully am a better one now. And so... Make sure you tune in then. It's going to be really wonderful. And I mean in two weeks, not next week. Mm. It's in two weeks because I'll be away next week. (laughs) Be well, friends. Thanks for journeying with us.